Darkcast Network. Come to the dark side of podcasts. We have cookies. Cookies? We love cookies. <laughs> Do you find yourself bored at work while eating your lunch? Do you watch the clock waiting for work to be over? As you're sitting in meetings, do you find your boss's voice sounding like a howling banshee? Then don't wait another minute. Tune into the Paranormal Peeps podcast. We are ready to entertain you. Hey. If you're a new listener, something you should know is big butts are okay. But what I really like is to drop swear words now and again. If you have virgin ears, this might not be the show for you. Otherwise, welcome. Come on in. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors, and welcome to another mini soda Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBTQ. I'm your ever-so-grateful host, CJ. Grateful? In the world we live in? What you talking about, CJ? Yes, warriors. Even though much of what happens in this world is totally fucked, the other day was Thanksgiving, and it's always been my least favorite holiday. My philosophy has always been, we eat every day. Why do we need a holiday to eat? Even though for years others have told me, no, you misunderstand, CJ, it's not just an eating holiday. It's a day for us to reflect on our lives and be thankful for what we have. I know to others it might mean different things. Some people here in America, they don't like Thanksgiving holiday because it feels like it's a colonizer's day. I guess it's just how deeply you look into it. I can respect how most people feel one way or another about it, but for me, This year was different, and it's probably because I've spent the last two years alone with no one to enjoy the holidays with. But this year, with my daughter and her boyfriend here, I wasn't alone. The house felt full. Of course, some of that is trying to walk around their big dogs who like to trip me. But seriously, the kids cooked the whole meal. The house aromas were astoundingly wonderful. The playful chatter of the kids in the kitchen and their music and every once in a while they'd pop in the den to talk to me. The pellet stove was warm and inviting. My heart felt full. Something it hasn't felt in a long time. So it was a great holiday for me. And I felt very grateful and thankful for you, my rainbow warriors. And as promised, instead of taking the holidays off, I'm putting out another mini-sode. This week, we travel to one of my favorite states to visit, Tennessee. And I have two short cases for you. Both took place in Knoxville. I'll present them in chronological order. The first case took place in 2002. 36-year-old Joseph Camber still looked like a boy in many ways. He was born on April 21, 1965 and he died on April 21st, 2002. So in all actuality, he had only been 36 for a few hours. Joseph was a bartender and an LGBTQ activist. His activism, it included work with AIDS patients. He was a co-founder of a gay computer message board, and he was the president of Knoxville Pride at the time. The Saturday before his birthday, April 20th. Joseph went out to celebrate at a gay bar called the Carousel. There he met a man, 32-year-old Chad Conyers, and the two began chatting. Chad wasn't from Tennessee, but from Virginia. He was only in Knoxville visiting a sick relative. By 1.30 a.m., the two men left the bar together. Sunday, April 21st, around 7 a.m. on a footpath between the Carousel Bar and the Baptist Hospital in Knoxville, Joseph's body was found. He had several cuts and abrasions along his arms and his back. The ones on his arms appeared to be defensive wounds. His pants and underwear had been pulled down to his knees, suggesting the possibility of some type of sexual struggle or assault. An autopsy would be conducted. 
it came back with Joseph having been manually strangled. But police were scratching their heads about who did this to Joseph. Thankfully, Joseph helped to catch his killer. You see, Joseph had scratched his murderer, and in turn, the killer's DNA was under his fingernails. The DNA from under his fingernails, well, it matched the man he had left with, Chad Conyers of Virginia Beach, Virginia. The police in Knoxville caught up with Chad and they had him arrested. He was extradited back to Knoxville. Once back in Knoxville at the police station being questioned, Chad told the police he did leave around the same time as Joseph, but he didn't kill him. And of course that's what he'd say to try to save his own ass. Finally, Chad gave in and admitted he was with Joseph and foreplay got a little rough. Joseph's death was a total accident. Nevertheless, Chad was charged with second-degree murder. He ended up pleading guilty to voluntary manslaughter, which we talked a little bit about in the case of trans man Kai Peterson. Kai had killed his attacker in self-defense. So, involuntary manslaughter is an accidental act. And manslaughter itself is supposed to be unintentional, which makes voluntary manslaughter confusing as hell. Manslaughter alone is supposed to be an accidental death, but voluntary seems to be a contradiction on the term. So here's where the clarity of it comes in. Manslaughter is an accidental death. Voluntary is intentional harm. So if you put it together, Chad intended to hurt Joseph, whether it be for his own sexual gratification or whatever, but he didn't mean to kill Joseph. Chad's defense team convinced prosecutors that Chad was a stand-up guy. He'd never, ever been in trouble with the law before. He'd never even picked up a guy for a one-night stand before this. Prosecutors agreed to lower Chad's charges to voluntary manslaughter. When the case went to trial, the judge granted Chad a judicial diversion which essentially means if he can stay out of trouble for 15 years, his record would be expunged and no prison time would be served. Can you fucking believe that ruling? For murder! That in itself just blows me away. Chad was allowed to return back to his home of Virginia Beach. And as it would happen, Chad, the stand-up guy and non-lawbreaker, he couldn't stay out of trouble. He was arrested in Virginia Beach at a mall in July 2003. What was he arrested for? He was a peeper, or a peeping Tom in a public bathroom as part of a police sting. As luck would have it, a detective walked into a stall at the mall's Sears store. Chad was in the middle stall. The detective took the stall on the left of Chad. Chad began to use his foot to tap out a series of different taps. Written on each of the bathroom stalls was a code. It explained what sexual acts each series of taps meant. For example, three taps, I suck your dick. Four taps, you suck my dick. Five taps, let's masturbate next to each other. You get the drift. The detective then heard what sounded like masturbation sounds coming from the stall next to him. Pretty soon, Chad was looking over the stall at the detective's junk. The detective asked Chad what he was doing, and Chad said he was jerking off. The detective then rephrased this question and asked Chad what he wanted. Chad's reply, I want to bust a nut. Chad was immediately arrested. And of course he pleaded not guilty, and then he gave a different version that had the detective looking at him. Come on, Chad. Truthfully, I have serious doubts that Chad was ever a law abider. He probably just hadn't been caught at anything before he murdered Joseph. Anyway, after his arrest for peeping, he was definitely in breach of his judicial diversion order. The Knoxville judge, who was so lenient with Chad, had to resentence him for the murder of Joseph. But still treating Chad with kid gloves and babying him along, 
the judge sentenced Chad to a four-year sentence. Not much unicorn justice for poor Joseph, I'm afraid. Rest in power, Joseph. Fuck off, Chad. Our next Knoxville case occurred December 20th in 2003. I'm going to be honest here. There isn't a whole lot of information out there on this case. Hardly any articles. But I did find a court document. However, it never tells us anything about what our victims were like, who they were as people. And yes, I said victims. There were two in this case. Samson McGee, who went by Mickey, and his housemate, George England. Again, I don't have information if the two men were lovers, partners, friends, or just roommates, but it did seem that they may have lived together or in very close proximity to each other. On the night of December 20, 2003, the two men left together from their home in Seaverville. They were headed to the gay section of Knoxville, which was about 35-40 minutes away. By the time they got to the gay section of Knoxville, it was already 1.30 a.m. Kurt's Bar, a gay club, was their first stop. But it didn't take long for Mickey to start feeling restless. He told George he was going to check out another place, and he went to another club called Rainbow West. Around 2.30 a.m., Mickey returned to Kurt's Bar. He told George that he met a couple of guys and he wanted George to meet him, too. At 2.45, Mickey and George left Kurt's bar. They got back into their Jeep, and they drove to a designated grocery store parking lot in West Knoxville. Pointing out the two men's car, Mickey told George to follow him. The two cars circled the block twice, and then the car with the two men Mickey had met drove into a graveyard, and George, he refused to follow him. Instead, he drove back to the grocery store parking lot. George got out and he went inside the store. The two men in the other car, whom I probably should have introduced to you by now, were Joshua Eugene Anderson, and I believe he was only 17 at the time. The other man was 20-year-old Timothy Chad Canaday. Yes, another Chad, but he went by Timothy. When they saw that Mickey and George weren't following him in the car anymore, they went back to the rendezvous spot, and they pulled up next to the Jeep. Timothy got out and approached Mickey's window. Not sure what was taking George so long inside the store, Mickey went in to fetch him. He told George that the guys wanted them to follow him back to their place. And so it went. The four men arrived in two different vehicles at Joshua and Timothy's home. Once inside, Joshua and Timothy started to drink alcohol and they were telling Mickey and George how messed up they were from the booze and taking Xanax. About 45 minutes later, Timothy left the room. George told Mickey he wanted to leave. Mickey took that opportunity to tell George Timothy was really into him. So when Timothy came back into the room, George asked him if he wanted to find a quieter place where they could be alone. Timothy laughed in George's face. And that's when George and Mickey decided they needed to leave. As they started to walk out the door, Joshua pulled a gun on him, and he told him, We want everything. We want your money. We want everything you have. George tried to talk Joshua down, telling him everything was okay and he didn't have to do what he was doing. Mickey, on the other hand, he got pissed, and he started to walk towards Joshua, saying, Fuck this. You're going to have to kill me. Mickey then put his hands on Joshua, in which Joshua pushed him away and then shot Mickey twice. George, fast acting, grabbed Mickey and he pulled him out the door towards their Jeep. Joshua came out to the porch and he shot Mickey again. Mickey fell to one knee and George helped him get into the passenger side of the car. This is where Mickey lost consciousness. Joshua kept shooting. George ran to the driver's side, and a menacing Joshua stepped off the porch. He was pointing his gun towards the Jeep. He continued walking towards the Jeep, yelling, What do you think of me now, George? How do you like me now, George? George tried the driver's side of the door, and he realized that the keys were inside the car. He pounded on the window to try and get Mickey to open up his door, but Mickey's body was limp. George figured Mickey was dead so he ran as Joshua was getting closer. 
George made it all the way to a children's shelter where one of the staff members was there to help him in spite of it being nearly 4 a.m. The staff member wouldn't let George in because of the safety of the children, but she told him to lie down on her porch as she dialed 911. While she was on the phone with the dispatch, Joshua and Timothy drove slowly past the shelter a couple of times. When the police arrived, they put George in the back of their car and they headed to the house George had ran from. The jeep was still there with Mickey's lifeless body, but Joshua and Timothy's car was gone. Police took George back to the police department for questions. While they were doing this, Joshua had just dropped off Timothy at his home, and then Joshua wrecked his car. Joshua was taken to the hospital, where the nurse tending to him thought that he might be under the influence of some substance. The nurse also found a pistol and bullets on Joshua, which were quickly removed and given to a security officer. The detectives investigating Mickey's murder got a description of the killer from George. They put out an all-points bulletin release, which got to the hospital staff. Joshua's toxicology report came back, and it was pretty clean. But Joshua did receive a police escort back to the precinct, where he was arrested, booked, and charged with first-degree murder. At his trial, the judge and jury showed him very little mercy, because he truly didn't deserve any. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Timothy's trial ended a little differently for his part in Mickey's murder. He was sentenced to 40 years and then paroled after nearly 12 years of being incarcerated. This was in 2015. Although Timothy Canada should have really remained behind bars. Why do I say that? Well, Timothy got involved in a really disgusting, despicable crime, and he was arrested again at the end of 2021. His crime was for the possession, transportation, and the distribution of child abuse photos and videos. It included some that were depicting infants and toddlers engaged in sexually explicit material. Timothy, this sick fuck, was arrested by ICE. And since it was a federal charge this time, I don't think he's gone to trial for it. But he should be locked away for an abundance of time. I'm hoping for life. And if not life, hopefully other inmates will do him in. I understand that other prisoners, they're not too friendly to sex offenders of children. Rest in power, Mickey. I love you, Rainbow Warriors. You matter. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. <laughs>